Dr. Eugenie Clark created a legacy destined to endure for all time. After founding the world-renowned Moat Marine Laboratory in 1955, her prolific career in marine science and exploration became the genuine stuff of legend. Through her work, she reached the heights of respect in science for innovative, game-changing shark research and became beloved around the world as the Shark Lady. Fewer people are aware of Jeannie and William R. Royal's early explorations of Warm Mineral Springs and Little Salt Spring in Northport, Florida. Their significant discoveries preceding written history changed our understanding of prehistoric human existence here alongside saber-toothed cats, mammoths, mastodons, and giant sloths. We're honored to have known and worked with Jeannie and to share this conversation about Northport's priceless historic and natural resources. Well, Dr. Eugenie Clark, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about some important history in our part of Florida. And uh, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about the history of Warm Mineral Springs and your experiences there, uh, particularly with William oh, Royal. Well, yes, of course, I'm very happy to do that. He was a wonderful person and a great friend. Well, indeed. And, uh, you know, he was uh, so instrumental in, in some early discoveries there that, that really have led that location to be the destination that it is today. He and also was our collector for several years. He was the shark collector for our lab. He used to go out and get sharks for us that we'd perform experiments with, taught them learning tricks, and uh, got the first evidence that uh, sharks can learn to discriminate between different designs underwater in order to get their food. Now, he talked a lot about that in a book that he wrote, The Man Who Rode Sharks. Is yes. that right? And I believe you wrote, uh, was it the foreword for that book, didn't you? Yes, I did, uh-huh. Yeah, now that, uh, that preceded your relationship with him in regards to Warm Mineral Springs. So that would have been oh, no. the, the, the shark work that he did for the lab? Was no, that... the, I have the book. I just pulled it off my shelf when I heard you were coming. The Man Who Rode Sharks. Uh, yes, that's true. He was our collector before he wrote this book, so he, he writes about it collecting sharks. So that was when it was the Cape Hayes Marine Laboratory That's at that right. time in the 50s, right? Mm -hmm. Just a few short years ago. Yes. Well, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, the first time that, that you and Bill, uh, William Royal, visited Warm Mineral Springs. I can't remember the first time. We went there so many times. Uh, he's the one who introduced me to the springs and uh, took me down the, on the deepest dives there and led me around and pointed out all the interesting things that he had found there under the stalactites, the human bones, and various things he would uh, show me. He left a most of it intact. And then we started to take samples and send them to, when we found a log, for example, underwater, we knew it had been under sediments that were many thousands of years old. So that was evidence that at one time it was dry. So your experiences uh, there, your, your first impressions of, of the springs after hearing about it, I, I, I would imagine he probably explained it to you. And, well, I and heard there was a place called Warm Mineral Springs and that it had magical qualities and maybe it's the spring that Ponce de Leon was looking for, the Fountain of Youth, things like that, lots of interesting stories. And I heard it was very deep and that uh, one man had gone down to the bottom of it, and that there was an associated spring, Little Salt Springs, mm -hmm. that had fresh water, and it was cold. So uh, it was interesting, but uh, there were very few fish in it. There were some little killifish around the shore, and, and some tarpon, some deformed tarpon at one time. And Bill came to visit me and introduced himself and said he wanted to show me these springs. So I decided to do it on my 
the side work for my fish. Later on, when all these amazing discoveries came up, and, and there was a lot of controversy about it, and our first scientific paper was turned down on the basis that it was unbelievable what we had reported. I, they later, the, the editor of Science magazine that we submitted the article to, later apologized to me and said his reviewers couldn't believe it. That's why he had to turn it down. But he said, we know that now that it's true and uh, that we're happy to hear you're publishing in American Antiquities, which is the journal where we finally published the results. And uh, Jacques Cousteau became very much interested. And he said, it's, it's marvelous. He says, if you can get me some of the bones, I'll have them carbon dated over in Monaco. So he, he took, we sent him some of the bones and we got our first dating from the, you know, the carbon-14 dating so that we could tell how old the bones were and they turned out to be, as Bill suspected, thousands of years old. Now Bill wasn't a scientist, he was an explorer yes. and a very curious man obviously. Yeah. who had a passion for answering probably his own questions in the beginning. Yeah, he, he was a very strange mixture. He was with the Air Force, a colonel in the mm. Air Force, and uh, his background was so different. And every time, every once in a while, he'd come out with such strange expressions, you know, but, uh, but he was an explorer and a great diver, and he had this great sense of direction underwater. Once... Uh, this anthropologist and I, we went into a cave and we lost our direction. And we weren't sure which way was out, which way was up, which way was down, because when you're in total darkness, you lose that uh, ability. And I remember Bill telling me that, well, if you don't know which way is up, you take off your weight belt. And if the weight belt hangs that away, then that way is up. <laughs> so he was a practical thinker then. Yes. He had a, a sense, I think it's a rare sense. I've met another man who had that sense. He always knew his direction without a compass. So he would get down there and take a hold of us and, and guide us around. It was uh, incredible in the dark, deep down in a cave. It was quite exciting. With him not being a scientist, uh, he was largely shunned as you just mentioned, by the scientific community. What yes, was but it? he respected scientists, and he came to us with his findings to tell us what, what he thought these things were and the age and so forth. He said they're very ancient, and most of the scientists didn't believe him in the beginning but we because we couldn't prove it. What but was it about him that, that, while others maybe dismissed his notions, what was it about him that personally for you, made you think that there might be something to what he thinks? Well, in the beginning, I wasn't sure because a lot of people would come with strange stories of undersea life to me. And when he first came, I didn't know. But he was so sweet and so sincere looking that uh, I said, yes, I'll, I'll go over and look at some of these things with you. And I realized that he may not be a scientist, but he knows a lot more about those springs than any scientist. Because he's gone down and with his clear head and clear sense of direction and his almost uncanny feeling of, of what part of the spring might be the most interesting and, and go there. The fact that he found that skull, that human skull, that nobody believed. And it happened to be with a photographer who was on the Huntley Brinkley newscast at that time. So I even got a notice from my professor in Scripps, and he said, oh, come on, we, we saw that, that discovery of a human skull with a human fresh brain inside that was discovered while Huntley Brinkley people were photographing you for a TV show. He said, Jeannie, that's going too far. They thought this was a little bit uh, and it too wasn't. much of a coincidence. That, it uh, wasn't. It was completely true. Now, in those explorations and those discoveries in the early days, compared to now with, with what we have in technology and equipment and, and 
gear. You know, what, what was it like? Obviously, he was really pushing the limits with what was available at the time. Scuba had just been recently uh, available uh, commercially. You know, what was it like? Did, did you give that much thought that sort of the compared to today, the primitive, you know, uh, you know, with regard to safety and, and, uh, and diving in unknown areas like yeah, in that? In those did, days, there weren't the rules and regulations that they have now. I mean, you can't do any deep dives like that without special permission and training and licensing and all kinds of things. But in those days, we were very free to do anything, <laughs> to go down into Little Salt Spring aiming to go to the bottom when we didn't know how far the bottom was. Nobody had ever mentioned it. And, you know, when I w we went down to the bottom, there were three of us who were the first ones to go to the bottom of Little Salt Springs. Uh, we didn't know how deep it was. And uh, when we got down to about 180 feet, it was complete darkness. We ha could only go by two of our lamps, one of which went out. So I had the only lamp, and I was looking at Bill Stevens above and Bill Royal below me, and trying to sh shine the light in their faces, and suddenly their faces looked strange to me. And I got this sort of overwhelming feeling that uh, we were like in another world, and that I was giving birth to a baby. This is what went through my mind. And the only other time I'd been anesthetized was when I was giving birth to my first child. and that that uh, that effect of nitrogen narcosis when you're down in the deep, which hit us so badly, and Cousteau told me later, it was because you were in total darkness. You can go down to almost 300 feet and not be hit that severely with nitrogen narcosis in bright sunlight where you can see where you're going. But in total darkness, in murky water, where the water was shaved up, it, it was the weirdest thing here, I thought, well, I've, I've got this, this gas coming in, they're trying to ease the birth of this child I'm about to give birth to, <laughs> and, and then I looked, and then I had this flashlight, and I looked up at Bill Stevens higher on the line than me, and he wasn't there. And then I looked down deeper, Bill Royal was there, but only his hand. There was no body attached to it. His hand was on the line. And then I noticed that he was sunk in soft sediment and his whole body was underwater and only his hand was sticking out still on the line. And I thought, well, he's like buried under this. What's happened to Bill? He's disappeared. His whole body is gone. Later we figured everything out. The bottom was all silty. And he had sunk into the bottom because he wanted to get the hard bottom and reach around and look for skulls. We had found lots of human bones, and he, but we couldn't find a skull at that point. And he said, well, maybe the skull has rolled off these ledges the, the, of the skeletons and that being the heaviest thing and round, it would go to the bottom. So let's go to the bottom. We didn't ask ourselves how deep the bottom is. We didn't test it. We just threw a line down. I guess the per people at the top later calculated how deep the line went. But the bottom of Little Salt Spring is soft sediment, like soft mud. And Bill had gone down into the mud. His hand was out on the line. He was under the mud, feeling around for a skull. Yeah, trying to and he didn't need his vision level. or anything. He had his mask on, and I looked at his hand, and I thought, well, Bill, Bill must be dead and buried, and I'm giving a birth to a child, and the other Bill Stevens has disappeared, so I thought I better go up, and uh, so I left him there, and then as I got up a little bit, I thought I ought to say farewell to Bill. So I went down the line to touch his hand and say farewell, and it wasn't there anymore, or I couldn't see it. And then I started to wonder about what happened to the other Bill Stevens, and then I looked up and down and this way and that way, and my head was whirling, and I was thinking about having this child, 
and I suddenly couldn't remember which side was up. I had this line in front of me like this. The line now was this way in my orientation. Of course, it was up and down, but I didn't know it, and I was so narked. And Cousteau said to me, it happens when you're in the dark. You lose your sense of orientation much easier in the dark, which I guess is true, but I didn't think of that. And I was had nitrogen narcosis the first time, and I think the only time I've ever experienced it that seriously, where I was hallucinating and thinking I was in a hospital and they were giving me anesthesia because the, the air becomes so strange when you breathe at that depth. So uh, I went up to the surface, and the other Bill had left a long time ago, and he was up there, his nose was bleeding, he was all upset. He said, I got nitrogen narcosis. I didn't know what I was doing down there. I said, I got it too, and Bill is still down there. Well, Bill never gets nitrogen narcosis. We didn't know that. He didn't tell us that. Of course, he looks like sometimes like he's got nitrogen narcosis at the surface. But when you talk to him, you... Did you ever meet Bill and t have a conversation? I was not with fortunate him? enough to have met him personally, no. But well, uh, that, that's a close call that I guess until you look back, you don't realize how close that was. Yes. I, I look up and down, and then I remembered his thing about if you don't know which is up and down, and you're holding the rope and it's going like this in front of you, and you don't know which way is up and which way is down, that's when he said, take off your weight belt and hang it. And if, if the weight belt hangs that away, then that way is up. And did you do that? You took off your weight belt to no. figure things out? You just... What I did was I reached for my bubbles, and then I looked around, and I had my w one little flashlight, and I saw the direction of the bubbles that they were going up off to the left, which was then level with me. And I thought, well, that way is up. So I w headed up that way. And... In no time, when I got to about 180 feet, uh, my head cleared enough so that I thought, oh my gosh, that was nitrogen narcosis that hit me. Now, how long do you think you were able to stay down in those days with the, the, the air supply that you had? A dive oh, like I had that. only one tank, but I don't breathe much. Every time I dive with somebody, they all have to go up be way right? before I they do. They call them air-sucking dogs, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have small lungs, and uh, I don't breathe much. And, and apparently you maintain your, your sense of calm. Time. And and I, I don't get frightened or excited mm. easily. When you get excited, you have to breathe heavier. It, it, did you experience much wildlife uh, in, in Little Salt Springs? is a lot different, obviously, characteristically. There's no wildlife except alligators, and they stayed at the surface. And so, and then somebody said to me, "Don't worry about being bitten by alligators. Once you get down to about twenty feet, they don't dive deep, and you'll be safe down there. You don't have to worry about them." But a friend of mine, Ramon Bravo, was told the same thing about polar bears. He said, "Don't worry about polar bears. They don't dive deep. Just stay below twenty feet." <laughs> but what about when you have to come out? And that only lasts so long. That's when Ramon was bitten. Ramon Bravo was the only man ever bitten by a polar bear on the way trying to get back onto the ice. But, you know, we never ran into an alligator. Did they you see were them? They were there. They were around the shallows. We saw little ones. But the big alligators we didn't run into. You know, the uh, fact that you were there so long ago and, and really started the discoveries there along with, with Bill. Uh, it was all Bill. I just tagged along with him. And I wrote it up at the end. Well, yeah, And exactly. I contacted that... all the scientists. I got the sunken log identified. I got the um, types of, of, of other kinds of plants to show that they were down there at one time growing because the level of one mineral springs was much lower. So those caves that went back underwater were once caves that were out of water and people were living in them and we found burnt burnt logs in the cave where mm. they had been making fires so we knew that they were we were dealing with a situation that was thousands of years old 
and indeed the dating of the bones on this one skeleton that I gave to Cousteau to analyze when he had the man analyze it. It was over 7,000 years old, and it had a brain inside that was fresh. And that's what the scientists went, oh, Jeannie, you better stick to fishes when you think that 7,000-year-old skulls would have a fresh brain inside, a fresh brain. And then I started to contact all the brain experts in the world. Tilly Edinger, Dr. Edinger up at Harvard, um, the man in uh, the British Museum who uh, exposed the Piltdown hoax, and a number of other great brain experts, and they all told me that there are evidences of brains being preserved. It's the only part that can be... And the ancient Egyptians that used to bury their dead and take all their innards out and put them into jars, the cheap embalming method that they used was not to bother with the brain. So when they found cheap graves thousands of years old in Egypt, the brain was still intact inside. And so the conditions in the springs obviously were and, very conducive for preserving. And then preserving. I learned that in Scotland there are peat bogs in which people have sunk thousands of years ago and the body all starts to disintegrate, but the brain is like a fresh brain in a peat bog. So this phenomenon is known. And when I was able to get the proper scientific papers to document this, my paper was accepted by... American Antiquities. So in many ways... Which you, is a very proper scientific journal. That's Well, that, that was what I was going to say. But we is, wanted it to come out in science, like a few of our other discoveries had come out. And uh, the science editor apologized to me later. He did. And said that he was sorry he couldn't publish my paper because it sounded very interesting. But that all the reviewers who saw my paper said it's impossible. Those things don't happen. We probably regretted that later. And the credibility that you having the notion to, to follow some of what Bill was telling you and, and to take it to that level uh, probably changed the course of a lot of understanding of, yes. of what, uh, what we've de learned. And delayed it. There was one man here in Florida called the, the Father of Florida Archaeology. Mm -hmm. He was a professor, doctor, everything. He said we were complete frauds that that brain was not anything recent. And they did. But he could, we could tell from the sediment that he got the, found the brain in, it was way underneath sedimentary layers that, had, that connected with caves with fire, remains of fires in them, which meant thousands of years mm -hmm. be, be, before when the sea level was down enough for those caves to, for people to live in and make fires. So Bill understood the whole thing. He put it all together. But they f figured he wasn't qualified. And then when the great Jeannie Clark fish expert came in and talked about it, s some of the people said to me, Jeannie, stick to your fishers. This Just, is another field completely. You know, look back and think, had you not done that, what that might have meant, you know, for what for our understanding about not only Warm Hill Springs, but I'm sure that every discovery. That's that, and at I mean, that time we tried to get anthropologists, mm -hmm. but very few people dived, and the the leading anthropologist in the state of Florida, who who was a diver, and I won't mention his name, but I can give it to you. He said it was a waste of his time to go down and look there. That he believed the whole thing was faked. One man's trash is another man's treasure. With what's going on with Warm Mineral Springs now and the uncertain future of it, it may be closed down uh, as early as June. Uh, well, you know, it's been a public attraction. It's been a wellness center. It's been commercialized, you know, in, in seemingly responsible ways. But there know? was a restaurant and right on the, that's right. the shore of the spring. And yeah. they, they, the last time I was invited there, they took us all to lunch and showed us and it was a big change from when we went there and nobody was diving deep in it anymore. What are your thoughts about the possibility of that being closed down and just being off access to anyone for any reason whatsoever, scientific or recreation or wellness? It's a great pity. 
would be a great loss. But things keep turning over, and I think in time people will come up with the fact that these two springs are unique in the state of Florida, in fact, in the whole North and South America. And it showed that, that the ancient Indians were here several thousand years before the anthropologists calculated that they reached Florida. Let, let me ask you this, uh, Eugenie. If, if, if you could talk to the powers that be that are, are holding power over the springs, um, you know, the value of science and being able to continue uh, at, at, a, at the minimum scientific exploration there, what would you tell them about the value of doing that to just as a start to, to attain baseline uh, data on the health of the spring uh, for the conservation of it and, and management of it in, in, into the future? What would you tell them uh, about the importance of that? I would tell them that it's a wonderful and unique situation not found anywhere else in the the whole continent of North America and that it should be studied and be available to scientists but I don't think my recommendation would be of much help because I study fishes and that was the criticism from the very beginning what does Jeannie know about this and what does Bill Royal know about this but you know evidence is evidence when you see those things once the, the Cousteau got the dating done for us, a lot of people changed their minds about how the unique possibilities of studying the spring. But somebody has to, who's well qualified, has to take the ball and run with it and get behind it. It's any project that you do, just like when we first started studying sharks, it was very hard to get any funding to study sharks. Who you know, and, and what could we learn about it? Fortunately, the Navy heard about our work, and they were, the Office of Naval Research gave us some of our first encouraging words. And so we started with the shark work, and we went off onto that, which I'm qualified to say. But I can't recommend this, except from my distance in science, to say that it is one of the most remarkable things in the state of Florida and perhaps the North American continent that should be studied in great detail. Do you feel it has an inherent value uh, from an ecotourism standpoint and, and promoting the natural resources of Florida as well as a scientific value? Yes, I think so. And it, it has already become uh, a valuable place for people to come and because it's so unique. Warm mineral springs, there's only one spring like that in all of Florida. Many people claim that when they bathe in that water regularly, that it cures their arthritis. I remember Iris Wilcock, who came down here so crippled. She went and bathed in it every day, and pretty soon she was up and around and, and, and said it had cured her of her arthritis. There's a lot to learn from warm mineral springs, but to have it properly investigated may be a problem because it'll take money and people of various specializations to find out the mystery of these, this remarkable spring. There's only one like it in the world. As a, a public attraction, that's a, a start to, to keep it open. Do you think that yes. just outright closing it would be a bad idea? Oh, yes. It should be available. It should be investigated. But people have to, you don't know what, like maybe real estate development helped support a lot of the work in Warm Mineral Springs. And Bill Royal moved there himself. And Iris Wilcock did. And they all wanted to do it, but but the combination of warm mineral springs and little salt springs, the right group of people got a hold of that and ran with it. It's There's still so much to learn. To meet Bill Royal and to dive in those springs, the two of them, little salt springs and warm mineral springs, they are remarkable pieces of the ecology to study in this continent. And, 
people will be interested in it and that it can also be used for the pleasure of people. Well, I, I don't think anybody could have summed it up better than that. And if you don't mind, one last question. In 1955, uh, you started and founded Cape Hayes Marine Laboratory, uh, a mere 58 some odd years ago. Uh, what's it like for you to sit here today, you know, looking back at, at those humble beginnings and see what this has all turned into today? Yeah, I'm so happy I had a part in initiating this, but what's developed has been the work of hundreds of other people that have gone into it, but even in my semi-retirement now at 90, I can enjoy the benefits of this laboratory and marvelous library we have, the office that they've given me to work in, the wonderful assistant that I have. Uh, I can still go on doing my work. And uh, I, I, this, this has been a very successful story.